Ken Ham has this book. Uh, Bill, I do want to say that there is a book out there. The Bible is the Word of God. I admit that that's where I start from. And no one's ever going to convince me that, uh, that the Word of God is not true. Ken is very proud of his book. He claims it has all the answers he needs. There is no Wikipedia bookmark on Ken's web browser, no bookcase in his house holding the 30 volumes of the 2010 Encyclopedia Britannica with its 40,000 articles written by Nobel Prize winners and other scholars of repute from across the world. Ken has this book. Everything he needs to know is in this book. And if modern scientific inquiry contradicts this book, then Ken is able to read between the lines of the book, see things that earlier generations of theologians missed, and hypothesize to explain away modern scientific discoveries. If someone proves an ice age, Ken will produce an ice age, which conforms to his book, but is never mentioned in his book. If science discovers dinosaurs, Ken will discover dinosaurs in his book, dinosaurs that no one before him had noticed. So as well as having this book, Ken knows all the things that happened but are not mentioned in this book, because they must have happened for this book to be true, and Ken knows that this book is true. This is what Ken calls historical science, which might sound a lot like making stuff up without regard to consistency or how much it flies in the face of all that science has demonstrated to be true, so long as the end result fits the required predetermined conclusion. But Ken trusts this book. Why? Because he knows that it is inerrant and divinely inspired. How does he know that? See for yourself. For 35 years, Ken has been collecting the evidence necessary to prove that his book can be trusted. The very best of this evidence has been distilled and is presented on the Answers in Genesis website. Let's take a look. Can you prove the Bible is true? Ken proudly claims that the good news is that God's word provides a simple but profound answer, an ultimate proof that nobody can logically deny. And supporting this truth is a wealth of astounding evidences. Well, I'm excited if you're not. Let's jump straight in. Part one is the ultimate truth. It appears that they are starting off with a slam dunk, so let's read on. Unfortunately, the first half of the page consists entirely of Bible quotes. The Bible is true because the Bible says it is true. If you accept that as fact, then I am willing to put you in touch with a very embarrassed newspaper proprietor who has Hitler's original and genuine diaries for sale. In the middle of the page, we do hit on the how do we know anything is true question. The key statement here is, when debating ultimate questions, everyone must eventually appeal to an ultimate standard. While I'm no philosopher, but I simply do not accept this premise. I do not think that I ever appeal to any ultimate standard. I prefer to appeal to the logical application of the scientific method, with a side order of Munchausen's trilemma, which leads me to accept that there is little, if anything, that I can know for absolute certain, but there are axiomatic statements that, through rigorous testing, can be trusted enough to use as basal assumptions upon which I can build to create a body of knowledge which confidently explains the universe around me, but which is always open to amendment and correction by new discoveries and new evidence. It is only the religious who cling to ultimates and absolutes, which of course they immediately have to give their chosen deity an exemption card from adhering to, proving in an instant that their absolute ultimates are ultimately not very absolute. The remaining half of the page is a continuation of Bible quotes, ending with two quite amusing paragraphs. Yet be careful not to rely on external evidences, since all people are blinded sinners, they resist the truth and refuse to believe even the most obvious evidences, assuming they just don't have enough information to prove you wrong. You will end up talking in circles. Based on the Bible's own example, you should point them to the only true ultimate standard, the Bible's own claims about itself. Ultimately, we trust the Bible not because we can prove it from other sources, but because we trust the one who made us and then gave us his word. 
These tell us not to rely on evidences outside the Bible because arguing evidences will result in you talking in circles. Rather, you should accept that the Bible is true because the Bible says that it is true, which is obviously much preferable to talking in circles. Well, if that was Ken's slam dunk, I might be in for an easy ride. Part 2 is entitled 7 Compelling Evidences. Number 1 is God's Character. This consists of nothing but a page of Bible quotes. I could replace this entire page with Why Severus Snape is a Good Guy and fill it with quotes from Harry Potter books. What would that prove? That my reading of the Harry Potter books suggests to me that Severus Snape is a good guy. Of course, there would be plenty who would argue against my analysis, just as there are many who would argue that the gods depicted in the Bible are anything but loving and just. But whilst the debate might be educational and entertaining, it would do nothing to prove that Severus Snape was a character who inhabited anything but the fictional universe created by Joanne Rowling, just as a page of Bible quotes does nothing to prove that the gods of the Bible exist anywhere outside of the universe created by the authors of the texts therein. Number 2. Claims of Divine Authorship Are AIG readers really this gullible? Not just the Bible's authors, but Jesus Christ himself claimed that the Bible was God's word. For anyone who is not absolutely clear on this, it was the Bible authors who wrote down what they claimed to be the words of Jesus. A pitiful piece of double counting and circular reasoning by AIG. The rest of the page? More Bible quotes. I hear those Hitler diaries can now be had for much less than their original $20 million purchase price. Any takers? Moving on. Part 3. Unity of the Bible. The Bible is unlike any other religious book, despite 40 authors writing from three continents over nearly 2,000 years. It maintains a perfect consistency of message. Its words point unerringly to Christ, whose work on the cross was ordained by God. Have you ever watched a Superman movie or read a Superman comic strip? For nearly 80 years, generations of writers and directors have presented Superman to us. How do they manage to keep the stories consistent? Of course, they have access to all of the renditions of the story which have come before, just as, in almost every case, the various authors of the Bible had access to the previous writings. It is hardly surprising, then, that there is consistency across the Bible series. What is surprising is that there is not more consistency. Despite literalists' claims, the Bible is riddled with contradictions and nonsense. My favourite example of a Bible author making an ass of themselves is Matthew in chapter 21, where the author has Jesus trotting into town astride two donkeys strapped side by side. The author was obviously attempting to prove that this scene was fulfilling a prophecy, but unfortunately he did not comprehend Zechariah 9.9 correctly. Where Zechariah states, riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass, in the King James Version, this would be better translated from the original Hebrew as riding upon a male donkey, a young donkey, the foal of a female donkey. The author of Zechariah is simply trying to clarify the animal in question, rather than describe two separate animals. The author of Matthew, not understanding the literary style of the original Hebrew, and most likely working from a Greek translation of the Old Testament text, had to devise an absurd story, forcing Jesus to sit astride two animals in his attempt to prove a prophecy which he'd misunderstood. Number 4. Fulfilled Prophecy Biblical prophecy is different from all other predictions. With incredible detail, forthright clarity and impeccable accuracy, the Bible has consistently unveiled the future for centuries. Don't build it up too much, Ken. You'll only regret it later. The first offering is Daniel. After citing Daniel's prophecies, Ken is quick to point out that, desperate to counter the implications of this prophetic phenomenon, 19th century sceptics concocted dating schemes that place the time of Daniel's writing after the events. Careful research by modern textual scholars, however, has validated the early origin of this prophecy, establishing Daniel as the authentic author. He offers as a citation for this claim, Josh McDowell. If you've watched Steve Shive's excellent series, An Atheist Reads, you'll have a clear idea of the credibility of Josh McDowell. 
If I simply pop over to Wikipedia's page on the book of Daniel, we see it citing Raymond Hammer. Hammer died in 1994. He was a big gun, a canon in the Church of England. He was director of the Bible Reading Fellowship, the main Anglican organization to assist in the reading and understanding of Holy Scriptures, and also a theology lecturer at Queen's College, Birmingham. So he knew a little bit about what he said when he stated, Daniel's exclusion from the Hebrew Bible's Canon of the Prophets, which was closed around 200 BCE, suggests it was not known at that time. And the wisdom of Sirach from around 180 BCE draws on almost every book of the Old Testament except Daniel, leading scholars to suppose that its author was unaware of Daniel. Daniel is, however, quoted by the author of a section of the Sibylline Oracles, commonly dated to the middle of the 2nd century BCE, and was popular at Qumran, beginning at much the same time, suggesting that it was known and revered from the middle of that century. Wikipedia then goes on to cite John J. Collins. Collins is the Holmes Professor of Old Testament Criticism and Interpretation at Yale Divinity School. He is noted for his research in the Hebrew Bible, as well as the apocryphal works of the Second Temple period, including the sectarian works found in Dead Sea Scrolls and their relation to Christian origins. And Collins states that, the actual historical setting of the book is clear from chapter 11, where the prophecy is accurate down to the career of Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, king of Syria and oppressor of the Jews, but not in its prediction of his death. The author knows about Antiochus' two campaigns in Egypt, 169 and 167 BCE, the desecration of the temple, the abomination of desolation, and the fortifications of Acre, a fortress built inside Jerusalem, but he knows nothing about the reconstruction of the temple or the actual circumstances of the death of Antiochus in late 164. Chapters 10 to 12 must therefore have been written between 167 and 164 BCE. Now, you can believe whatever you want, of course, but the AIG claim that Careful research by modern textual scholars, however, has validated the early origin of this prophecy, is one that, I would suggest, is not 100% representative of the facts at hand. The page goes on to describe Ezekiel's prophecy of the destruction of the Phoenician city Tyre. Now, prophesying that Tyre would fall was like prophesying that it would rain next year. Tyre's location ensured that it was on the front line throughout history. It was most recently bombed by the Israeli Air Force in 2006. Ezekiel claimed, They shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil to the nations. Of course, the tens of thousands of people who now call Tyre home would dispute that. The nearest Tyre ever came to being scraped off the earth was when Alexander the Great took the city in 332 BCE. Of course, Alexander did not raise the city. Just 17 years later, Alexander's former general, Antigonus, had to lay siege to the very same city once more. Anyone with the ability to read, and the inclination to do so, will know that Ezekiel's prophecy was never fulfilled. AIG's next offering is Isaiah's amazing prediction concerning the coming reign of the Persian king Cyrus, 200 years before his birth. I shall not dissect the book of Isaiah as I did the book of Daniel, enough to say that the modern consensus is that Isaiah is the work of at least two authors, and the later part of the book, including the Cyrus prophecy, are of later authorship, written during the Babylonian exile, and it is therefore highly likely that the words were written after the event, not very prophetic at all. AIG then talks about messianic prophecies, as if the writers of the New Testament did not have access to the Old Testament. It is a simple question of gullibility. If you want or need to believe that the Bible is absolutely true, then you leave no room for reasonable scepticism. And that is it for fulfilled prophecies. I was expecting something more compelling. Number six, scientific accuracy. The Bible is clearly unlike any other document in history. Every claim it makes about science is not only true, but crucial for filling in the blanks of our understanding about the origin of the universe, the earth, 
fossils, life and human beings. The more we study and learn about the world, the more we come to appreciate the Bible's flawless, supernatural character. They might be reading a different Bible than me, but let's see. The page continues. Scientists have run into all sorts of interesting questions about the physical and biological processes that produce the world we see today, but they are limited to observing, testing and experimenting with present processes and creatures. They can only guess about the past based on fragmentary evidence and biased assumptions, which they cannot scientifically prove or disprove because they were not present to observe what happened in the distant past. This always amuses me. How can anyone not see the logical disconnect between one mouth claiming we cannot know what happened in the past, whilst the second mouth is preaching that it knows for absolute certainty that a 2,000-year-old book is an accurate account of events which happened thousands of years earlier? It really is that simple. If we do not know what happened in the past, then we certainly do not know what was going through the minds of human beings who were writing things on rocks, tablets and parchments thousands of years ago. What we do know with a high degree of certainty is that for the past two and a half thousand years, since the Greeks began studying, the physical rules which apply to the natural world have not changed. And it is the modern application of these physical rules which allows us to apply a plethora of cross-correlated dating techniques to prove beyond any shadow of reasonable doubt that creationism is nothing more than primitive fable. Back to AIG. Astronomy. The Bible claims the universe had a beginning, Philosophers and scientists rejected that claim for over 2,000 years, but now astronomers believe the universe had a beginning, the so-called Big Bang. Yes, science has taught us that the universe, in the form we understand it, had a beginning, and there is a solid theory explaining the evolution of the universe from a time shortly after the hypothesized Big Bang. The Bible, like every other creation myth, religious and pagan, claims that the universe was poofed into existence. There's no science involved in that statement. Anthropology. The Bible claims that all humans are one blood, descended from one man and one woman. Some 19th century biologists argued that different races descended from lower animals, but today genetics has verified there is only one human race. Genetics provides evidence to us that modern humans certainly did not originate from one man and one woman provides evidence which suggests that modern humans might contain DNA from more than one primitive hominid kind, and provides evidence that we lost the ability to synthesize vitamin C, a trait we share with other haplorhini, dry nose primates, when our evolutionary branch split off from the strepsorhini, wet nose primates, which all retained the ability to synthesize vitamin C. These are just a couple of continually growing evidences which support evolutionary theory. Biology. The Bible claims that God created animals after their kind. Until a creationist comes up with a definition of what a kind is, it's fairly pointless debating them on this. For a start, read Leviticus chapter 11, 14 to 22, and you'll see that locusts come in many kinds. Creationists ignore Leviticus when discussing kinds. It is only the uneducated and those who prey on them that still deny evolution is a fact. Ken and his Bibaloons will claim that camels and llamas are the same kind, whilst denying a relationship between humans and the rest of the great apes. They also provide no mechanism whereby the ancestor of the camels and llamas walked off the ark and within a few generations had diverged to the gross extent which they have, yet then remained stable ever since. Remember that for Ken, the laws of nature do not change. Yet somehow, magically, evolution sped up after the Ark landed to give us the vast diversity recorded even by the early Greeks, Egyptians and Mesopotamians, but then ground to a halt so that no new wild animal kinds emerged for the past two and a half thousand years. Odd that. Geology. The Bible claims that God destroyed the earth and the creatures inhabiting it in the worldwide flood. 19th century geologists argued that rock layers and the fossils found in them were formed as sediments were deposited slowly. But today geology confirms that many rock layers were deposited catastrophically, burying fossils within only minutes or hours. Let me start with today geology confirms. I'm sorry Ken, but in your worldview geology can confirm nothing. It is historical science, remember? If you want to start down the line of 
geology confirms, then we could make a list of what geology confirms, and we would quickly see that geology confirms that the Earth is millions of years old. 19th century geologists argued, yes, I am certain that they did. Geology was in its infancy in the 19th century. But in the five human generations that have come and gone since then, evidence has been collected and sifted using the tried and trusted process we call the scientific method, such that the many thousands of geologists worldwide all agree on a consensus which only a handful of creationists refuse to accept. We now understand that sedimentary layers were deposited over millions of years, and that within those layers we find fossil layers which were formed rapidly. There's no contradiction here. It is kind of a requirement for land animals to be buried quickly if they are to survive long enough to be fossilized. This is the reason that there are so few fossils of land animals about. And that's it for Bible science. Number six, archaeological finds. The Tel Dan Steel. Where did the dating of this steel come from, Ken? I hope it wasn't using any of the techniques your website goes to so much effort to rubbish away. I have no issue with the Tel Dan steel. It mentions House of David. AIG claim these three words prove that the United Monarchy under King David existed in history. Well, not really. If future archaeologists dig up a plaque on which it states Britannia rules the waves, that would not prove that this island was once united under a ruler called Britannia. But let us accept AIG's extrapolation based on not a lot. If David existed, to be added to the many historical figures attested in the Bible, this would do nothing to prove the earth was built last Tuesday, men rode dinosaurs to work, or that Noah kept hippos on his yacht. The Misha steel. AIG have taken liberties here. I gave them the Tel Dan steel, but the existence of the word David on the Misha steel is far from universally accepted. But if something suits you, why quibble over it, eh, Ken? Once again, the existence of historical people and places does nothing to evidence the wacky world of whales eating men that creationists want us to swallow. The Nabonidus cylinder. Critics of the Bible had claimed for many years that the account in the book of Daniel was wrong. They said Belshazzar was never a king in Babylon, and that Nabonidus was not his father. Well, try to keep up to date, Ken. The cylinder was found in 1854, so whilst it is true that only the Bible mentioned Balthasar before the discovery of the cylinder, 160 years have passed since then. Cephas Ossery. In 1990, a startling discovery was made that shook biblical scholars and archaeologists alike. In the Peace Forest section of Jerusalem was discovered a burial cave containing 12 ossuaries, one of them being none other than that of Cephas, the high priest who presided at the trial of Jesus. This amazing discovery provides us with a powerful historical connection to the events described in the Gospels. If you accept this statement without question, then you are doing yourself no favours. There are several reasons why scholars question any connection between the ossuary and the biblical Cephas for you to read about. Again, we have Ken's monkeys leaping to accept a crumb which supports their story, whilst completely ignoring their own mantra that, if you weren't there, you don't know. I have no problem with it proving Cephas. Hell, they can say it proves that a man called Jesus was tried and nailed to a cross. There's nothing supernatural in any of that. AIG's last offering is the Pilot Stone. Those scholars who questioned Pilate's existence and the Gospel accounts generally were silenced with this amazing discovery. Those scholars? Must have been before my time. I always thought that Pilate was pretty much accepted as a historical figure. He was mentioned by Tacitus. But once again, the existence of any person is a mute point when trying to prove magic, demons and angels exist. So this page suggests that proving some of the historical figures in the Bible existed somehow proves that the Bible is the word of God. In which case, the existence of historical people and places in any work of fiction would prove that the entire piece was actually a factual historical record. The next time I am on the moors, I shall be sure to keep a lookout for the Hound of the Baskervilles. Number seven, life-changing powers. Well, any recent convert to Buddhism, Islam or Scientology could make precisely the same claims as made here. I'm glad that I worked my way through these. It is now very clear why Ken Ham's family business spends so much of other people's money on trying to rubbish the work of dedicated scientific professionals. Ham has been around for a long time, and if this is his best effort at proving his magic man in the sky with the pet talking donkey, 
then he really should question why he believes it at all. Thank you for watching.